Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's speech on education and talent. A warm welcome to all my panel members here. Thank you very much for being here today. This is a very extremely wide topic, but education, higher education, has become more and more crucial as we move into the 21st century. And this year, 2022, has also brought alongside unprecedented societal issues. Yeah. If we take into consideration that we are into the second decade of the 21st century, yeah, it also means that we are already immersed into the fourth industrial revolution. This fourth industrial revolution means a far more automated, digitalized world. Swiss systems that we currently are using are becoming incompatible, and becoming incompatible with what we are looking for in an industry. I'm not saying that the higher education has become outdated. I am saying that the higher education needs to move at the same speed as the industries. Yeah. The Mediterranean region, like any other region in this world, has an impact, has been impacted by globalization. It doesn't change anything um, with regard to us. If we look at today's model, yeah, this model needs to be changed from a higher education. But according to the forum from yeah, the World Forum, there are various aspects that we need to be looking into. We need to start giving or offering the resources that tomorrow's industries require, not today's. Today's we're covered. Yeah. But in five, six years' time, yeah, we have to question ourselves whether what we are delivering is what the market needs. So there are key words such as mobility, such as upskilling, such as reskilling, such as questioning what talent definition should be, because there is a gap between what the higher education sees as talent and what the industry recognizes as talent. Another thing also that we need to is the new model that we are we we need to implement. It is true that today many business schools, yeah, the European University or EADA here, have implemented a far, like Geneva Business School myself, we have implemented new ways of teaching, which is not really new, but a more practical approach, like with Cagliari, etc. But we still retain the old grading system. Does a six over six mean you're qualified to hold a job? Or a 10 over 10? Yeah. Because what we're grading you, many occasions, is not what the companies are looking for. So we need to readapt that model. So how do we translate grades into a new way of evaluating your skills? And last but not least, this comes up with one big question. Yeah, uniting or bridging the gap that we currently have at a global level, not just the Mediterranean, where industries and the higher education need to work closer together. Because at the end of the day, education and industry are the foundations of any nation. They work alongside, they work in parallel. As you see, there is a very, very, very wide topic. Now, let me just introduce all of my colleagues. So, please, Marta, if you may, just introduce yourself and we just go. Okay, my name is uh, Marta Miguel and I'm the uh, Director of Business Development at the Escola Europea, which is a training center owned by the Port Authority of Barcelona. And we are just, you know, trying to align the needs of the port industry uh, not only in Barcelona, but also in the Mediterranean area to uh, what uh, academia uh, is uh, offering. Thank you very much. Jodie, please. 
Hello and good evening everybody. I'm Jordi Diaz. I'm the Dean of EADA Business School here in Barcelona, which we are happily celebrating this week 65 years of existence, uh, coming from, from very much industry and, and, and going all the way to offer even bachelor programs today. So I'm, I'm <clears throat> as the Dean here, representing our institution, one institution that is uh, considered among the top 25 in Europe, according to the Financial Times, and also well-ranked, I mean, and, and, and holding the international accreditations, but very close to real life. So this is what we like to say. Thank you for, Thank for inviting you very us. Much. Thank you. Pier Francesco. So, um, yes, nice to meet you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Pier Francesco, and uh, I'm the president of the European Student Think Tank. Uh, we are uh, an international uh, youth uh, NGO. Uh, whose mission is to bridge the gap between the, the European Union, the European uh, Union, and uh, the young people uh, through uh, giving uh, uh, the young people a platform to express their ideas. Uh, thanks to the research that we do, uh, our cooperation with uh, uh, the new institutions and many other stakeholders, uh, companies, uh, embassies, national governments, and other youth organizations, and also through um, the organization of events, uh, trainings, uh, and workshops that are opened. To, to all uh, the people who would like to, to, to attend and to be there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Selim. Yes, good morning. I'm pleased to be with you today. I'm Mr. Megdesi, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business at the Lebanese University. Uh, today I'm here because I coordinate the UNIMED subnetwork on employability which groups uh, 31 universities from 15 different countries, and we work together on enhancing employability at our universities. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Bani Mohamed. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Ashraf. I am uh, the Vice Dean for uh, Business School at the University of Jordan. Uh, I am uh, also working with UNIMED on employability, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Uh, I have been working for a little bit here and there as a consultant for the private sector, and uh, I, can, I can say there is a huge gap between uh, academia and uh, industry. So uh, hope that we have a joyful discussion today. Thank you very much. Salim. Hello, everybody uh, here and online. Uh, I'm Ihab Soliman. I uh, come from Egypt, but I have the double nationality, Italian and Egyptian. Now I'm, I'm working in the International Mobility uh, Student Office in University of Cagliari in Italy. And I'm so, so happy to be with you. And we are going to speak about uh, all our special project to, to increase and to, to move uh, the mobility for uh, the student for different uh, countries of the world uh, to come to study in our university, like refugees, like for med, like Unicor, and many other projects. Thank you. For Thank you. And Mr. Scalisi, please. Hi, I'm Marcello Scalisi, director of UNIMED, that has been mentioned. UNIMED is Mediterranean <laughs> University Union, which is a network of universities around the Mediterranean region. We have 150 universities from 24 countries and we started 32 years ago and one of our priority for sure is related to employability and entrepreneurship but of course no, not all this and uh, just to mention that in these days we did an important event in Brussels that we called Unimed Week in Brussels which is an, a, a meeting to try to push European institutions to do more for our region, and two weeks ago we, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the first Mediterranean Student Summit, a uh, meeting of students discussing about the university that they want, which is also related to employability, but not only, of course. Thank you very much. As you can see, albeit the fact that we need to move forward, many of the institutions, many of the gentlemen and lady sitting here in front of us have already put the mechanisms in place and in some cases mechanisms quite a long time ago both for you but this does not mean that you, that, that all of the higher education sector is moving at the same pace yeah now I think I believe that, uh, Marta, you have a really great um, example of showing how a school was born through an industry. 
in your case. So if you'd like to explain, because these are examples that we need to take into consideration to understand how we can move forward at a very fast pace, but throughout the Mediterranean region at a very similar speed. And I think speed is one of the issues that is challenges, challenging the higher education in the Mediterranean. Okay, so Thank please. You. Thank you, Nicola. So from our point of view, from the Port of Barcelona, uh, we are a very diversified sector. So in, in the port, we have nautical activities, uh, commercial activities uh, linked to many types of cargo, and we need a lot of different profiles. And usually the ports and, you know, the, the, the maritime industry, it's, uh, it's very unknown. So sometimes uh, young people, you know, when they think, what, I, what do I want to become when I, when I grow up? they don't think about port. So that is the first problem that we have, that we are a little bit invisible to you know, new generations to try to uh, attract this talent, to be trained, and then to come to work to, to port. So first thing that uh, we do is to try to uh, implement this uh, visibility of the port in the, new, in the new generations. To do that, of course, we had to align um, the, the, the training centers, because they need to explain to young generations how, how ports work and that there is uh, plenty of opportunities there, and also what uh, industries need. So first thing that we did in the, in the port of Barcelona was to set a round table, you know, to sit uh, both industries, the different types of companies that we have in the, in the port, also uh, different uh, training centers, vocational training centers, uh, masters, uh, and the uh, scholar ourselves that we are kind of a different uh, training center because we are right in the, in the port, so very linked. So we were kind of the mechanism to link both, uh, both worlds. In this table, what we try to do is to uh, detect what are the needs in the, in the industry, uh, what the companies are uh, expecting from the new generations to join the, the port, the new workforce, and then we try to create, uh, uh, let's say, actions and initiatives that put them together. So, like, for example, as I said, uh, try to teach the, uh, the counsellors <laughs> when they are in, uh, in you know, uh, finishing the studies at, or higher education that they need to decide what they have to uh, study, if they have to study economics or uh, medicine or something like that, so to try to expose or um, show that the port has opportunities uh, and which are the trainings that they can follow to finally access to, to the port. Um, also working directly with the, with the training centers, with the teachers, so uh, the teachers need to be in touch with the industry, so they need to go to the companies, they need to uh, experience firsthand what happens in the company so they can transmit it to the, to the students. And then, of course, uh, professionals also need to go to the companies, uh, sorry, professionals need to go to the training centers to explain directly to the students how their job is done. So uh, at the end, we have this, uh, this uh, collaboration between uh, training centers and, uh, and, and companies merging to the training of the, of the students. These are just little, uh, and I don't want to, uh, because I could be explaining some others, but I don't want to take a lot of Thank time. Thank you very much. You, you've said the key word, and I'm going to ask, ask now um, Pia Francesco. You said the word, detect what the companies need. Why are you detecting? Why, why do you need to detect? Because if well, we need to be knowing what they need. Yeah, so um, speaking from the point of view of my organization, um, we, we noticed that this, there is this gap between like the, what the companies, what the work market, the job market asks, and uh, uh, what, uh, I mean, the young students that uh, uh, still study or graduated can bring to these companies. And uh, uh, despite the fact that we are uh, like focused on uh, EU policies, uh, um, so we do practical research, um, my organization uh, uh, believes uh, strongly to uh, the, um, the importance of uh, training uh, a young student, a young person, not, I mean, after he's uh, graduated, but while he's still studying. So um, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, aspect that uh, each student should 
um, should uh, and also all the other stakeholders should um, should take into account um, because uh, uh, I mean the youth, youth organizations like us give the um, the opportunity to uh, not waiting uh, to to have graduated uh, to yeah to develop uh, soft skills that uh, are required by the job market for example um, communication skills uh, public speaking. Uh, uh, the ability to organize events, conferences, both in person and online, since, uh, uh, since two years we, we switched also to online formats. Uh, so um, I think that uh, uh, young people should take uh, advantage of all these opportunities that come from the, an, a fruitful cooperation between youth organizations, uh, institutions, higher education uh, institutions, because I think that uh, I mean, each of these, these stakeholders uh, alone can't uh, can do um, beneficial things alone, but we need to, to create synergies between all these uh, stakeholders in order to, to provide for uh, yeah, trainings, uh, workshops to, um, that also refer not only to the formal education, but also to non-formal education. So even attending an event like this, uh, it's a very important opportunity to network, to, to develop like uh, public speaking skills, uh, uh, diplomatic skills. So uh, all these things should be taken into account by a young person and my suggestion is to uh, just not focus only on studying uh, like for the exams but try to diversify the, um, uh, the background of a person joining a youth organization, joining uh, um, all the, the stakeholders that give young students the opportunity to, um, yeah, to develop their skills uh, while they are still studying and not yeah, waiting the, the graduation day to, to start thinking about, oh, what can I do now? Uh, so, um, yeah, um, I think that this is the key, one of the key points to, um, for a young person to be more att attractive for the job market once uh, he or she will, uh, will graduate. Thank you very much, Peter Francesco. This gives foot to another, another two key words, well, three key words, mobility, upskilling and reskilling. So I know that we have the uni med and everything. So um, in order to create a good flow, if you don't mind. OK, well, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. So, and, I, and let me go back to one of the words that you said is speed. Speed is one of the big challenges that we have. I would say speed and scale. Those are the two challenges. And when we think about, uh, we, we tend to connect education to, let's say, the youth only. And this is one of the, the main things that will change in the years to come. And is that what we've done in university or even in a master's or whatever, I mean, this is, this is starting to be almost irrelevant. The world has changed so much, and especially in the last uh, 10, 5 years, that if we go back to what we did in university, potentially we will do the wrong thing. So this thing about upskilling, reskilling is that we all have to become like lifelong learners. And it doesn't mean to go back to, to business school. I'm not trying to sell the business school. I'm trying to say that one of the key factors for anyone to be able to cope with this, with this unprecedented uh, you know, uh, scenario is by revisiting. Revisiting what we have done and, 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 and adapting. And when we uh, define upskilling is basically new, new skills for your current job, your current profession. Reskilling is new stuff for new professions. And this is also another thing that goes hand in hand with education, which is we have to assume that, that there are going to be uh, uh, so many jobs that will disappear that this is, this is a no-brainer, this is happening. But at the same time, many work uh, positions, many jobs will, will pop up, jobs that did not exist before. So this reskilling is trying to, uh, to, to adapt you to these new, new challenges. So I would say this is speed and scale and understanding that uh, there is, I mean, the years where you were in university, then potentially a master's program, and this is over. This is, this is not anymore the, 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 the world in which we live in. So, and, and, and to close up my, my contribution here is, once again, going only to university or business school is not going to be enough. So here, this is a ma massive challenge for, for, obviously, for the educational sector, but also for governments. I mean, there are already phenomenal initiatives in Singapore, in, in the UK now, uh, which are trying to say, what, where is the country going? Where is going to be this country in five years' time? Assessing what is the 
the, the skills that I have in the talent workforce and preparing a plan to cover this gap because the gap is enormous. So it's education, it's government, it's companies, it's the private in industry platforms that can, can give us this scalability. So all together trying to create these ecosystems to face the enormous challenge we have uh, in front of us. Thank you very much. It's, it's true, you know, our life today is all about um, it's constant learning and relearning. Um, I remember when I studied at university, I was not allowed to think. I was told what to think. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, now I'm in a position where I can think. Um, so thank you. This comes on the, the upskilling, the reskilling, and we'll go to the, 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 the reskilling later on. But this, is, this brings on another topic, the employability and the mobility. So, um, Celine, would you like to, because you've been focusing a lot on on mobility, would you like to explain to us how this is being addressed currently today um, through Unimed, etc.? Yes, uh, thank you, dear colleague. Uh, thank, uh, I will thank also my, uh, my fellow speakers. In my opinion, it is very necessary and relevant nowadays uh, to, to unlock the future of our students in the universities and uh, to see them as the future world citizens, or why not the future world leaders. So uh, this has to be done through higher education, higher education institutions and skills development. And this is our main objective in UNIMED, where a subnet was created two years ago. It is the UNIMED subnetwork on employability. Uh, as all my fellow speakers said, we have to work on bridging this gap between the education system and the business world, uh, which is the labor market. I do believe that higher education institutions should not keep following the old model of inculcating ideas to students, but to adopt the model of skills development provider in order to, as I said before, to unlock the future of our new citizens. Thus, we have many challenges. Yes, I know that we have many challenges. To better respond to the challenges facing our region, but also the, the whole system, uh, all the actors, so as my uh, fellow speaker said, the governments, the universities, uh, the students themselves, all the actors concerned are called to mobilize and make the most of policies implemented at all levels. Well, you all know we have a lack of autonomy. We have uh, some uh, economic regressions in some countries, financial crisis. In Lebanon, you know, we have many crises. The living expenses, the instability, unemployment, job loss, uh, lack of infrastructure, inequality, technology. Uh, mm, we have lots of challenges. I think we can have some solutions. It is mainly the importance of life skills to be provided by our institutions and the partnerships and agreements. I'm talking here about communication, about coordination between us, about consultation between all of us. It is the potential to lead by influence. Uh, well, Given the increasingly pressing importance of the technology as well, the technology industry, and the need to address the digital skills nowadays and life skills gaps, we at Unimed Subnetwork on Employability are set to form the foundations of this, of this new world of work in our education institutions as well. And we are committed to spread the entrepreneurship skills. Here, it is not necessarily startup creating but I'm talking here about entrepreneurs' skills, which prepare students for the current challenges, whether graduates are planning on working within the technology industry or other industries or create their own businesses. Mobility is very important. That was uh, what I meant when I talked about cooperation and partnerships and agreements between all of us. What we are doing in Unimed Subnetwork on Mobility is to gather and share information, is to conduct studies, analysis, research papers sometimes, is to encourage dialogue and mutual exchange of information, mutual exchange of students, mutual exchange of professor, 
organize international and regional and international events, promote the exchange of students and professors, as I said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I've got to cut you now because we only have X amount of time and I'm afraid that we still have three panel members that need to speak. Uh, I do apologize. And okay. We can always have another no session. Problem. Thank you. Um, I, I like I liked the, the frankness that you were speaking, and the, uh, the lack of infrastructures, uh, unemployment, uh, yeah. crisis, financial crisis, etc. But you were speaking about the, the life skills and the learning skills. And I bet the fact that we're going to jump back to employability and mobility. We do have a question here. Um, it is true that we're trying to prepare our students for the real life, but what are we grading them on? You know, this is where we have that gap between talent, as we interpret it in academia, and how talent is interpreted in the business or in the industry. Please, I know this is one of your topics, your favorite topics, uh, remodeling the way we assess our students. Uh, I, I'll tell you just, uh, just uh, a real example. I had two students. One is an A student, and uh, another guy was, you know, almost, you know, he, he was okay. So he, he just graduated. Uh, unfortunately, the A student, uh, up, since five years, he didn't uh, get a job till today. Uh, the other guy, he just immediately, you know, he was hired and was hired by, uh, you know, a financial company, which I, I don't know how he managed. <laughs> and then I was really very much interest, interested in knowing why, why this happened. You know, when you meet the employers, it's always about, you know, please bring me people who have communication, who have the basic learning, who, ha who wants to learn. And don't worry about the technical skills. I will teach them the technical skills. Everybody have to go into this, you know, uh, onboarding process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, up to now, uh, as you know, uh, we, uh, in the Higher Education Institute, we still grade our students in the, the old-fashioned way. They have to memorize, they have to write. Can you imagine that I have one of my colleagues in the business school who's still teaching entrepreneurship uh, through a book <laughs> and the students have to make an exam. So I, this cannot stay as, you know, as you all know, this cannot stay like this. We have three things that we need to focus on. We have three pillars, I think, that we need to focus on. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I think we need to change the mindset of our professors. Uh, and, you know, we need to teach them, although I am a professor and they, this, they will not like this, but we need to teach them that, uh, uh, life is really going very much fast and uh, you know we, they have to be agile and, and, and they have to learn the second thing i think we need to rethink our curriculum uh, we cannot stay you know uh, based on these textbooks alone uh, to in order to graduate people who are qualified for the industry the third thing i think we need to focus on is more doing more relevant research based on market demand not based on our promotion uh, guidelines. I want to get promoted to associate full professor, but um, I think if I produce and I become the highly cited scientist in, in the whole world, and my research is not relevant to the market and the economy of my country, I think it's, it's uh, not viable. I think these are the three main issues that we need to rethink. I, I can echo Diaz when he said um, uh, it's about agility. Uh, we, 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 universities up to now are living in a very old uh, way that have been, uh, been there for a long time. So uh, basically, these are the three things that I think we need to rethink, and this is what we try to do at, uh, in our collaboration uh, throughout the Mediterranean. So we are trying to learn what is going on in, in Spain and replicate the success stories and cases in Jordan or in Lebanon or uh, in the, the whole. I think um, the learning curve would be much uh, better if we, and we become much more agile if we work together uh, throughout the Mediterranean because my skilled people can work from Jordan and they can uh, be outsourced in Spain, in Italy, in whatever, so they don't even have to uh, immigrate to, to other country. At the same time, I'm, I'm doing good for my country. Thank you very much. Um, I had to have smiled because when you said that you've got to train and teach your teachers, I, I'd have to question whether maybe you have to replace them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
Um, because I, I think we need to... I, I fully agree that we need to uh, have more practitioners as professors. Ex not uh, academia. And this is what I, because the academia obviously has a different focus and uh, not always contributes to improving our economy, generating. It's crucial, it's essential, but in today's world, it is, does not always respond to the reality that we're looking for. Uh, so, thank you very much, Mr. Soliman. So, bearing in mind what all your panel members and colleagues have said, you've got a great success story with the University of Cagliari and the Unimed. A beautiful story where you have private funding to bring in students from different Mediterranean areas, usually the, an area which has low economic region in this case. Yes. And you are creating a future and those young men and women are global, have become global citizens. Tell us about this success story because it's a little bit like what Marta has done, but on a different level, please. Uh, both of, yeah, and Ma you. No, no. Uh, uh, Marcello is... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a very nice and particular story, and, but let me say before, uh, because this conversation is extremely important, not only for the Mediterranean region, of course, because it's something that is related to all our societies. Uh, but there are two elements that we have to consider. First, about speedress. During the pandemic, the university showed that, the, that they react very fast. In a day, more or less, they moved from on presence online, almost in a day, with a lot of difficulties, a lot of problems, obstacles, and in particular, this is very, it's very uh, important in, in southern Mediterranean countries where families faced a, a lot of problems to have kids at home studying all together, when one or two laptop probably and so on. But the university, in a way, were able to, to manage this. This means that the university has the capacity to follow what's happened, but only if they are obliged, because we come back to what Salim said. The lack of autonomy in southern Mediterranean countries related to our education is extremely important. It's not the case of Jordan, fortunately. But it's the case of Lebanon. In Lebanon, we have just one public university and more than 50 of private universities. It's a very complicated situation. Uh, in, in Algeria, there is an important lack of autonomy. Everything is controlled in a top-down dimension. How the university are able to react about what we are discussing about if they don't have the capacity and the autonomy. The agility, to man, zero. The agility, exactly. And also is the same case in several other countries. All this to mention that mobility could be the way to, in some way, to influence the system, to attract the interest of colleagues of both sides of the Mediterranean to work together for the benefit of their own uh, students. It's extremely important to attract the private sector, but it's another story in terms of autonomy and independence. In some cases, it's not possible. Or in some case, they join the board of the university just in checking mail during the meeting, and that's it, because at the end of the day, it's not a concrete uh, 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 participation. But coming back to the experiences that we are doing with the University of Cagliari, University of Sassari in Sardinia, with a private foundation, this uh, Fondazione uh, di Sardegna, that every year they sponsor four internships to, to Sardinia from Maghreb countries. Now we are trying to enlarge also from to other regions of the world and to other countries and so I don't want to enter in detail about the study that they do and so on, but to see, we did a movie of these experiences and to see some Tunisia students talking in, a, in Italian with a Sardinian accent, it's very nice because at the end of the day we create a sort, I don't want to say integration because it doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't think that we have to talk about integration, inclusion, so it's life experiences. And mobility is first of all to improve our capacity of our youth to move in a very agile way in this very crazy world. We need the Mediterranean generation. 
Mediterranean generation means students able to understand our differences and to move in these differences like in a, in a richness way, not thinking that are an obstacle. Because in Europe, we created the European citizenship through Erasmus. Okay? We, the Erasmus program, which is the most famous program of the European Commission, it's impossible now to cancel this program. If, if a politician wants mm -hmm. to say something against, they, obviously they, they go in jail probably about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we create this also Erasmus families, Erasmus babies. I'm used to say also Erasmus divorce. It's life, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that we have to create the same in our region because with mobility, the day after, a right business. We have a lot of European companies that started through an Erasmus experience. Youth working together, studying together, then decide to make business together. Uh, there are few of these opportunities, unfortunately, in our region. There is a lack of cooperation among countries in the southern Mediterranean region. The Mediterranean region, let me say, doesn't exist because there is a lack of regionalization, a lack of integration. And our hope is that through mobility, through these important experiences, European Commission finance, not enough in my, my perspective, but in any case, 10,000 scholarships per, 10, scholarship per year, which is not enough, but it's something. But I think that we have to continue also with private donors and other opportunities, but also why not inviting a business school to attract talents from other regions of the world. In, in an experience of with a, a company that supports career center of universities, something that in some way I should have mentioned, they say the private companies want the best and the university try to allocate not the best because mm -hmm. the best in any case they found a, a position, a job and so on. How to combine this is through dialogue and first of all I think that through mobility of our students. Thank you very much. Yeah, you, you also have a very nice story to tell, haven't you? <laughs> I think because in, in uh, my main job in the University of Cagliari and in our university system, we adapted some uh, skills and some uh, approach, but we have a slogan, flexibility and legality in all our projects. And when we started years ago with FORMED, uh, we started working in the Mediterranean region to create a new identity for the foreign student. Our foreign student, when they move from their county, they, th they uh, live in our uh, region in Sardinia. They live for uh, more or less two years. And after they decided to come back in their country and uh, to be like uh, our ambassadors in their country or to still living in uh, Italy, in Europe, most of them, they went to uh, Bruxelles, they work in Belgium, they work in France. They, uh, they have got a new identity, Euro-Mediterranean identity. With our uh, projects and our project of mobility for high education, uh, this is our contribute. And uh, if you don't have a good flexibility in your internal system, for the professors, for the administrative, for the ambassador who work to give them the visa and to live in the city, you will not have success. Uh, if you imagine, for example, a foreign student, 20, 22 years old, okay? He moved for the first time from his country. He leave his family. He will find himself in another country. He don't speak this language. He don't know anything about the new system of education. They need to be supported. And when they find a good uh, support and a good accommodation, they feel like at home. In our university, we work together with our students to feel like in the family. Our ISMOCA office, ISMOCA, it means International Mobility Student of Caralis. Caralis is uh, Cagliari in uh, Sardinian language. They feel ISMOCA like th that home. And I remember during the pandemic, they, they, uh, they left to come at home 
in our office, but we started working together to go on with uh, these uh, problems. And now I am so, so happy because we received more or less 180 students in seven years. And most of them, they decided to leave and to uh, promote our, their uh, enterprise in Italy. They, uh, someone had get married, some, someone uh, wanted to, to bring his family here. And uh, remember, because if you help a student, you help, you help a family, not only the student. And in this possibility, our professors are modified completely our process in the study. I remember seven years ago, we didn't have a lot of master degree taught in English. Now we have it. Our administrative colleagues, they didn't know anything about the evaluation of the foreign uh, title. Now they know. I am so happy because the first, the second edition of Format helped me in my job. They come to welcome the student in the airport. They go with them to try to, uh, to have a, a room. They explain for them how they can lie, they, have, they can live, how they can manage the money for the first time in their, uh, in their life. You remember when, when uh, you are a student at home, you don't care about money. You have your parent who spent for you. But when you are in a foreign uh, company, a foreign co uh, country, you have to manage your scholarship. Exactly. And if not, you will fail. Yes. And it wasn't easy for my student, but I am so, so happy, really, because we, our system was flexible and we have got many, many success. And with a private company like the foundation, and I think the next, uh, the next time we are going to have an agreement with ASCAME because our students who study want to have a stage. And I think ASCAME can give us can a, a good, uh, good help. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much. This has brought some, you know, you've, you've raised two top, various topics. It's very clear that we speak about the region, the, the Mediterranean region. There is no uniformity. Uh, the problems that facing at uh, national level cannot be, cannot be, are not the same, they're not equal. There's a great disparity. Uh, listen about uh, Lebanon or Jordan, etc. It's, it's very, very different. The, the challenges that you're all facing is very, very different. But I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Yeah, we're speaking about mobility, but we're speaking about the fourth industrial revolution where as our colleague here said, new skills are required. We're using new tools, new businesses. At one stage, do we expect students to have virtual mobility and not physically be present in another country? Because I believe that is where we're going to. Yeah, not through blockchain and metaverse, not yet, but potentially at some stage, it, it is going to be true. We've already introduced blockchain into um, schools yeah, for our diplomas and for checking uh, diplomas. So these are big, big challenges as well. It is true that we're facing today, but we're addressing tomorrow with tools that we still had in place 10 years ago. Is that the way forward? So can, yes, please, this is an open question. Okay, so, so I think, I mean, I would, I would rather take it, so substituting the, the, the beauty that we are enjoying here today, seeing each other and, and connecting, I think that's not what technology can bring. I think, I think this, is, this is probably too narrow. I think the point is making the impossible possible. There is the, the real potential of technology. So making the, the, the impossible possi possible, meaning people that could never think or even dream about going to another part of the world, uh, working in a, in a given assignment project with the students and colleagues from uh, different parts of the world. So why not focusing on those ones that cannot enjoy the experience, making it possible, and then, because if, if, we're, if not, what we are trying to do, or what we will potentially end up doing is to the ones that, that can go abroad and can enjoy this experience, we will even, even get it better and better. And then, you know, the world turns this week 8 billion. 
It's so a non-linear eight, eight, eight billion. So we are many of our discussions are attacking and attaching this one to five percent of the population. Why don't we try to go into the extreme? You know, the other the other side of of this pyramid and making this mobility global experience because also that could help us with one of the major problems we have in, in, in today's world, which is peace. And sometimes it's also understanding the other. So I think technology can help us to make the impossible possible, to create uh, group assignments, group or multicultural experiences for people you, that cannot enjoy this I can experience. interrupt you, make quality education universal. Yeah, that, that, that could you know, be a good summary. Yeah, I think, you know, we've got uh, institutions or beautiful organisations called Hope where they're working definitely on this. I go to Myanmar and, um, you know, the Rohingyas, which is a, obviously we're not speaking about Mediterranean now, but these Rohingyas were the people without a nation, people without an identity. Today have far better education. They have an education. They are refugees. But when they lived in the country, they were not, they were not allowed access to education. Mm. So this is what I'm trying to get to. You know, we, we're looking at people that can afford, and we can speak about fees. Um, we can speak about the public versus the private uh, institutions, education. We're going back to, okay, let's think how we can help, because at the end of the day, it is, we're speaking about industry, we're speaking about economy, we're speaking about trade that introduces social, social aspects, integration, yeah, bringing down of barriers. So let's see how, and technology allows us to do this. It is true that uh, loans and grants are necessary for many, many students, many students do not have access to what we in today here, I think all the panel agrees, would be considered a quality education. But why not? Why don't we make it happen? I, uh, please, no, I, I, I would echo uh, Marcelo when he said, you know, you cannot imagine the experience of a guy coming to uh, Spain, uh, to Barcelona, or coming to Amman and living there. You know, it's a, it's a mind, it's changing the mindsets. Mm -hmm. It's the people that can't afford so, it. And these, are, will, these will become the leaders, you know. You cannot imagine what Erasmus Plus, they can understand that this is, uh, this is a guy like me and he have a family. And, you know, this is really very much important. It's, it's about building peace. And again, I think uh, it's a win-win situation. Uh, it's a win-win for the countries, bo both, both countries. Uh, if we say about building this piece. And it's also a win-win situation for the industry. At the end of the point, I need a, a graduate who have been to places who have the experience to deal with the diverse team. I would, I would say, like, uh, if we go to the statistics, like 97 million new jobs will be created through technology, through the fourth industrial revolution by the World Economic Forum uh, by 2025. Uh, more than, uh, I think, 140 million new jobs in the green and circular economy will be uh, introduced. Uh, so these jobs, these are not only technical jobs. jobs. Uh, they, they, we need to, to, you know, to build it together. You know? So uh, I, I think you know, we need to utilize technology as a way that, uh, you know, especially with the tools today. But again, I would also... Uh, uh, emphasize the importance of physical mobility uh, and the mo mobility in the Mediterranean. I, I can talk on behalf of my students, the guys who have traveled through Erasmus Plus and who have joined these programs, they come with a different mindset. They come back home with a much open, uh, 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 welcoming mindset. So. This is the kind that we need to create throughout the Mediterranean. This is my point of view. You know? I, I fully agree, but at the end of the day, not everybody has, can be a leader. Not everybody can afford, and we have that big gap between those that either funded, got loans, etc., and those in the areas where we really need to build an economy, where we really need to introduce um, industry. 
areas where these young men and women and not so young men and women okay don't have access to any kind of tool that will help them in a way contribute effectively not always as a leader yeah, but, but also as a support depends on the on the on uh, the, the solution of this is not the, the technologies, because at but the end the is not only be, because because uh, the last two years the European Commission launched a virtual exchange program. We were part of this initiative. Thirty thousand youth had an opportunity to exchange virtually, to know each other, to know about the other side of the Mediterranean, north or south, religion, culture, food. Mm was an amazing experience and probably is the tool to improve a physical mobility experiences, in particular from the north to the south, not only to the south to the north. Sure. But more importantly, there is also a need to improve regional, horizontal regional mobility, I mean south-south mobility, because they don't know each other also relationship among Algeria and Jordania and the Egyptian and Moroccan. They, we, they don't create this region, unfortunately. They look at us in a bilateral dimension. They want to move to Europe and so on. And you are right. It seems that, globally speaking, only the 3% of the students, have, have, university students, have an international mobility opportunity. What about the other 97? Mm. Of course, this is for sure. But looking again at our region, I think that we have to improve the international mindset. Uh, and mobility is one of the tools, of course, but not only mobility of students, of course. Mobility of researchers, mobility of leaders of universities, uh, youth organization, of course, youth organization play an important role. Students organization and not only, and so on. We need to create this framework where people is free to move and don't want to open the door about visa problems. <laughs> it's another story. It's better not. Okay, it's another story. <laughs> but freedom of movement to be able to look at this region, because we, you, as European in this case, I say, without southern Mediterranean countries, we collapse and vice versa. We are obliged to work together. Unfortunately, we have a lot of things in common. This is the reason why we have to enlarge the door of our organization more and more to others. Uh, this is true for universities, but universities, in a way, they, they have an international path. They have an international organization, international departments, international projects. They do a lot in terms of how to improve internationalization. But for sure, we need op more opportunities to improve this dimension that help what we were discussing about employability, international portfolio of youth, and why not? Once they have an opportunity to, to work in international companies, they come back, as Ashraf said, with an important mindset that could obviously offer to their own society. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I do, I do agree, and I think you, yeah, please. Yeah, if you can uh, yes. yeah, elaborate more on this. Um, so, yeah, speaking from my organization, it's, uh, I mean, we are 150 members uh, with, and it counts like more than 35 nationalities. Uh, so all our work, I mean, almost all our work is, doing, is, uh, is done remotely. Um, and that means that, I mean, we take advantage of uh, technology and uh, virtual uh, tools a lot. But what we face it as students, as young people, is that, I mean, uh, yeah, we, thanks to technology, I had the possibility to, to meet uh, people from all over Europe, all over uh, North Africa, uh, all over the world, uh, but there is still the need to meet in person. So, um, uh, I mean, we, we were blocked by the, the pandemic, so that uh, it uh, caused the, the stop to, to personal meetings uh, that the organization had. Uh, before, um, and uh, um, so I mean, we I think that uh, it uh, should be um, all re relativized in the sense that uh, technology should be at the service of the people and not the people at the service of technology. That means that uh, we should take advantage of technology tools that uh, can allow us to meet any other person in all over the world to to work, uh, to to research. Uh, 
because it's very simple, but I think that we don't have to miss the opportunity to always meet in person uh, and to, uh, to do all the things uh, in person in multiple cities. Um, and that in place also means a, a lack of, uh, of money, of funding, so that I think is the, one of the most important parts that uh, I mean, funding uh, should be I mean, increased by institutions, national governments, the institutions to let young people to, to meet. I mean, international mobility, thanks to the Erasmus program, but there are also many other programs uh, less, mm, less known than the Erasmus that allows people to, to travel, uh, to, to meet all the others. So also programs that are run by any other international organization. And I, for example, I had the opportunity to, to follow up a course sponsored by the Council of Europe and the uh, League of Arab States. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, we should take advantage of technology to do what uh, it could be uh, easily addressed to te with technology, but we don't have to, we, I mean, we mustn't miss the, the main focus that is to create and enable I, I in personal you, relations. I don't, Pier Francesco, I don't think we were missing that. I was just saying that we're yeah. all here, you sitting here, we're all facing today's world. We're not looking 15 years ahead. And if I look at what the United States is doing and how it's been worked and how things are moving, we're looking at artificial intelligence, we look at data, um, etc. Careful, the human interaction is absolutely crucial. But what I'm saying is that we need to make the most of the platforms that we have to enable those who cannot come, and I'm going to insist, those who cannot come and travel and have that experience, still have access to some kind of experience where they can understand and get and gain cultural awareness. I'm not saying that we substitute it, yeah, because yeah. humanity is human. If I might say yes. something about that. So I know I'm putting everything down into practice, but um, the examples that you were explaining about how technology ha can help us to interact with, uh, with others, uh, in, in our case, we were very much affected in the, in the pandemic, you know, to uh, develop trainings and so on. So uh, because, uh, well, we were very much in, the, in immersion, immersive uh, training, um, we developed a platform uh, through a European project, uh, actually from the NECVC Met, from, so including several uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, in which we set a platform uh, simulator, tra training simulator for international trade, in which uh, students would become workers or employers of a, of a freight forwarding company, and then they would be exchanging uh, international operations with some other students in another country. So, for example, some students in, uh, in Barcelona would be sending a container, two containers, to Egypt, and then over there in Egypt there would be some students that would be doing the import process of those uh, containers. So, in this sense, they put themselves in a working position uh, that they would uh, probably become in the future. Uh, they experience real life uh, working experience from a simulated point of view and then additionally they get the chance to interact with someone that is in the other side of the of the mediterranean and try to get this flavor you know of internationalization and try to um, uh, even though they cannot see each other directly to try to interact with another culture with another language and with another uh, person at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Marta, because this is very much what's, what we're seeing now, the introduction of gamification okay. in higher education, yeah. uh, which is becoming extremely uh, successful as well. You know, at the end of the day, we have created technology in order to make our life easier, sometimes not as, not as easy, but we cannot ignore it and we cannot ignore where industries are going and how it's impacting from a very lineal world. Today, we are living in a non-lineal world entirely, and we need to address it in that way. And, it, and you've used the word mindset, and it's true, we need to change our mindset. We're already doing it. We're already changing our mindset, but not all at the same speed. And as you said, the lack of agility, um, the lack of autonomy in some institutions makes it extremely challenging to address tomorrow, let alone three years' time. 
Yeah. And it is clear here that the best examples are when the different stakeholders, as uh, Pier Francesco was saying, get together and commonly share what the next steps are. And I said, funding from private institutions to be able to develop these young men and women to respond to their needs and their forward thinking as well. I think it, that, is, that is a very, very important formula which needs to potentially be more introduced and more apl applied, uh, and especially to, to public universities as well. And public universities, we're speaking about practitioners, maybe change the lecture approach to a more of a practical approach. True. Yeah, so that they just don't walk out with a theory or the, the, the theoretical knowledge, but they can apply that knowledge in a real case scenario. So thank you very much. I think we could be going on for hours here. It's extremely interesting. So we've just touched briefly talent, mobility, technology, um, the different stakeholders, the different new models that we need to look at. And I'm sure that we all agree that we're doing that so far. Yeah, overall, we are responding. We're responding very, very well but we still need to continue focusing on building those alliances. And again, building alliances between higher education institutions, building alliances with everybody, because one of the things that we do have to make this world better, and we're speaking about peace, is knowledge. And that knowledge is something that, yes, um, if we look at it from a data perspective, is worth millions, but it's something that we can do to contribute to a better world tomorrow. So thank you very much, gentlemen, lady. And I was wondering if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Please. OK, so is there a microphone? So don't, uh, yes. You've got a lady behind you as well. So I'm not too sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting discussion. So um, today you've been discussing like the educational, higher educational system, and the challenges. So I would take the opportunity now as a student in one of these higher educational systems. Um, how do I see these challenges and like how do I adapt to them in order to integrate into the business world? Uh, you know, we face this question all the time. I think uh, maybe uh, Dia said, uh, being here is one thing that you can uh, that you are doing uh, just to make you better you know i think uh, you don't need to to uh, the university is not about courses it's not about you know go to the, going to classes it's about meeting people it's about you know ha going to activities about developing your own skills don't expect, as a professor, I, I'm not talking. As a professor, if I would, you know, you know, advise you, I would tell you uh, just, just be, try to work on your skills, try to meet people. I'm sure today you will find, you know, a lot of uh, businessmen who can become, you know, your employer at one point or another. So, and this is part of of, of the learning journey. Uh, your course is really very much important because it will give you the intellectual knowledge that you need. But at the same time, I think it's much, much more important for us that you go and uh, like, do like this. You, know, you come to these events, you participate, you, you try to develop your own skills. I think this is really very much important. I am, I am very sure that uh, this would be very much helpful. You don't need to care about how institutions are changed. You know, uh, universities is really very much old style way of doing things. So you don't need to, to, to worry about them. Let them do what, what they do. And you try to do or you try to learn. That's it. Thank you. I, I think there's some other ladies and gentlemen asking questions. Thank you for the opportunity. A very, very interesting subject and uh, I'd like to make a few comments and also ask a question. Um, I think we are at a stage where we have to, uh, somebody mentioned mindsets 
and I would, I would link that with entrepreneurial mindsets. And I think we shouldn't look at entrepreneurial skills now when we are adults. We should look at them and teach, teach the entrepreneurial mindset to a six-year-old, from six year upwards. Because it changes the whole world, uh, the whole way you see things. Um, lately we've had a, I come from an employers association, and we had a very interesting um, talk about uh, upskilling and, uh, and reskilling. And we came out, as I'm, to, I'm talking about businesses behind me, um, we came out with three very valuable things that employers look for at interview time and in people looking for jobs. Problem solving, creativity, and innovation. Without those, you are set on a level. With those, you are set on a much higher level. So th these, these are things that we should look at um, the lady in front of me asked what, what more should, should they have. We also, from the business side, we also look at your extracurricular activities. Were you ever on a committee? Uh, do you practice sports? Do you, like the gentleman has said, who represents the, the youth in Europe. Um, those things are all badges on your side. The more you collect, the better you are in line up for a job and the more you are preferred. And one comment I'd like to make, lifelong learning is not only for students, for lecturers and for politicians too. So at this time and at this stage, um, uh, we must look also at bespoke training. We've had shortages of labor all, all over Europe and at this stage, how do, how do you look at this as part of upskilling? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, uh, Mr. Selim, would you like to, I've seen you nodding, would you like to answer uh, the lady, please? Yes, um, um, I totally agree about uh, what the lady said. In fact, institutions and companies must now work together in order to nurture effective skill development and help equip graduates and employees. I'm talking here about the long life with the skills that we all need in the coming years. Um, if, uh, if you know, um, at the university, we have to, uh, to learn how to learn all our lives. Uh, it's, a, it's a long life learning. So it's not about uh, what uh, my colleague Ashraf, uh, uh, like he said, uh, it's not about courses and the grades. It's about learning in all our life. So. Uh, about the bespoke um, learning uh, was the question. What do you think about it? Because obviously, um, according to the World Economic Forum and according to the business, different business associations, that is, uh, that is something where we should be moving towards as higher education institutions. Do you yes, have our university. No, okay. Please, can you, Salim, you can continue. Yes. Um, uh, again, we are convinced that graduates are to be considered as skill providers. So we have to develop their skills. They are not just job, job seekers. Um, in, in our world uh, today, the new world of work, uh, technology industry, uh, mindset, we, we have to set those uh, uh, skills about analytical thinking, innovation, uh, learning, uh, problem solving, uh, you know, critical thinking, creativity, originality, taking initiatives, those are the top skills we need in order to live the new economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, just uh, a quick uh, reaction actually to uh, 
uh, our young spirited uh, participant. Uh, my name is Ala Ez. I'm speaking on behalf of ASCAMI as well as EPSOMED. So what we will do, which I believe, like our chairman said in the opening session, let's walk the talk. So let's walk the talk. What we'll do is in our uh, business help desk platform, which is present here in the ground floor, we will do a slight amendment in it where we will include internship, targeted internship for university students, link them with our members. Perfect. Thank you. And this, this way you'll get the skills, the experience, and you get something very important. You'll know real life. So instead of guiding your studies in a direction uh, that you dream or you think is the future for you, you will get a flavor of it. Maybe you won't like it. So at early stage, you can switch. Maybe you will love it. You'd like to carry on more specifically. And by my experience as an employer, almost 80% of my interns I have recruited. So I think this is also a guarantee if you prove that you're good, that you really get the opportunity. So Indeed. visit us within uh, one month, <laughs> because software amendment will take a little bit. Uh, it's an EU project, EPSOMED. It's a regional one covering the whole EU and Southern Mediterranean. And we can network with all universities, all partners. And this way, I think we can walk the talk and the time is now as the slogan of this Meda Week. Thank you. Thank you. Again. All right, so thank you for the wonderful discussion that I've been following for the past hour now. Yeah, um, but so my question specifically goes quite similar to my colleague here in regards to students and how we transfer their skills into jobs. Um, so I've had a lot of students in terms of my colleagues, the people that I study courses with over a long period, a long period of time. I, I keep getting the same question from them. Hey, 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 Raiden, how do I apply for a job? And I, I always answer them, I'll just, just go, just go on LinkedIn, put in your resume and just apply to as many as you can. <laughs> um, and, uh, Oddly enough, they come back to me and say, hey, Raiden, I didn't get a job. I'm like, oh, that's, that's too bad, friend. <laughs> um, so what ends up happening is these university level students that do have actually quite a decent amount of experience, as well as people that have graduated and have asked me, hey, can you help me with my CV and such, they tend to not get jobs over a certain period of time. So. My question is specifically in regards to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everybody needs like food, water, yes. The next thing is security. And this is something that I feel like a lot of universities tend to, well, just based on what I've seen, um, not provide to a lot of students. A lot of students still feel like very confused or feel very foggy about how do I get a job after university? Um, and so, so, so what, what is the question? So sorry, the question I'm, I'm is, quite the, so the here. question is, okay, sorry, how, okay, the question is essentially, how can the universities or higher level uh, educational ed institutions provide this security to students? How can uh, you guys guarantee that a student will get some form of a job after graduating? I think it's a dream. <laughs> it's a dream for all the students. It was the same for all of us, I think. But uh, uh, really, really, uh, each solution can become uh, realized if you work with a good team. You know, uh, study in the university, it's not like in the past, you, you will have attend courses and that's enough. You will live like a student. It means you will live all the events that your university can uh, give it access for you. Seminars, uh, all the opportunities to be in contact with uh, private sectors, with uh, enterprise. It means it's not immediately the solution, uh, but you have to work like a student on yourself, beginning, but I think uh, our universities have to adapt a new systems to give more opportunity and assistance with the new models because the, um, the, the difficulty it's not uh, it's not equal for me and for you it's different between each other 
and we have to adapt it, a specific solution for each one of our students with a good relation between the student and the institution. It's not immediately easy because I, I know, I know the universities more, more or less are uh, adapted the old system. But now with the new technology, with uh, the new approach, we can give more assistance to be in relation with uh, the region reality. Uh, I would uh, just, uh, the lady behind you, the beautiful lady behind you, she just, told you. She just told you that, you know, go out to any, uh, most of the businesses need employees. There is this, you know how much new jobs are there? Just whenever you meet a businessman, always they want to hire. But the issue is the matchmaking, you know. You cannot just put a resume on LinkedIn and just submit it, you know this. You have to update your resume, you have to know who, who are you applying to. You have to do, they have to do jobs. We are doing at Unimed, we are trying to develop, we know that there are career center, career development center uh, most, in most universities. And uh, we look uh, at Harvard, Yale, most of their, you know, these career centers, they have a structure and they, they keep also a network of their graduates. 90% of uh, Harvard uh, graduates are employed by other Harvard graduates or they start their own business. So, but uh, the universities, now what we are trying to do with Unimed is to restructure and reinvent the career centers in order to uh, create like a bridge between the university, between the time you graduate and the, the, the market job. It's a, it's a program like six months where you go into this program, you learn how to approach the employers, how to develop your CV, what is available in the market, do you need upscaling or reskilling at what, what skills? So I, I, would, I would say like you need uh, to be more in contact with this if you have a career center at the university. I think this would be helpful. Thanks very much. I'm afraid, afraid we're running out of time, I've just been told, but I was going to say one thing. A CV is only a first knock on the door. You have to sell yourself. It's personality, it's character, it's attitude, it's the wanting and desire to learn, it's team play, it's spirit. It is the human side. CV, there's so many CVs that are going to look so similar. The only thing that may differ is the names, the surnames and the ages. You are the one that sells. You are your best marketing tool. Okay, so thank you very much, ladies. I'm afraid that we have run out of time, um, but we will still continue asking questions because I believe that some questions at the back. So, okay, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hashim Hussein. I'm heading the UNIDO, United Nations Industrial, Industrial Development Organization, Investment and Technology Promotion Office in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And I'm also heading the Arab International Center for Entrepreneurship uh, for the last 30 years. We have been working, me as an investment expert, oh, yeah, we have been working to enhance the ecosystem for small and medium enterprises. And then most of our work is in the Arab region, uh, we had a big problem in the Arab region for the entrepreneurial culture 20 years back. So it was very well known that the, uh, the first traders, the first entrepreneurs came, were coming from the Arab region some time back. Uh, nowadays, because of the education system, what we call it the classical education system, it does not boost entrepreneurship. Uh, you go to the school, then you go to the university, then looking for a job, that's all. There was no, um, there was a big weakness of entrepreneurial culture in most of the Arab, uh, in most of the Arab region. So we started to work developing program. Then we realized that education is the issue. At the, we started at the university level, uh, and we know we found that no, it will be too late to work only at the university level. We had to go to the secondary and then to the primary schools. Now we have programs to develop skills for teachers, mm -hmm. you know, how to boost uh, the mind entrepreneurship in, in the future uh, of the students. So we realize this is, has been helping a lot, that there is a big um, mindset changing 
that the, the students, they're looking not only just to be at the faculty of medicine or to be an engineer, no, to be in, 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 in a business. So uh, my message is, when we work in any entrepreneurship program or in any ecosystem, uh, it's, not, it's not the issue of access to finance. It's not the issue of developing a good business plan. The issue is education. So most of, most of our work now is in the ecosystem, we start with education. Where is the education? What are the programs uh, which is there to boost um, development of entrepreneurship? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and I think you seconded what the lady has said, that you need to start from a very young age, and agree that when we're speaking about higher education today, we should be speaking about education in general. Thank you very much for your contribution. Ladies, lady, gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, sure. And gentlemen, ladies, thank you very much for being here today for us. Salim, thank you very much for joining us Hello, remotely everyone. and have a lovely afternoon in Jordan. Thank you. Thank you.